Okay, so today we're looking at chapter five, which is dosage forms, which is what does the drug look like? Is it a solid or a liquid? Um, and then routes of administration, as in how does it get into the body? Okay, so um, pharmacy technicians have to be able to interpret prescriptions properly. Every prescription must have a form and a route. So don't just say take, um, take one three times a day. You always want to say take one capsule and then by mouth. That's an example of a form and a route. The form is the capsule, the route is by mouth. So that's the only thing that we can add to a prescription. Um, when, we, when we're typing it into the computer and we produce a label, the only thing we can add to it is the form and the route. So uh, we wanna make sure that we do that. Um, one of my pharmacists uh, that I work with for many years, Bruce, um, and I actually named my dog after him. <laughs> um, he used to hand me back a label and say, you tableted a capsule again, because I would constantly just type TT for take one tablet. And um, so then I'd have to go TC for take one capsule. I'd have to, to fix it, uh, even though I knew that amoxicillin or whatever the drug was comes in a capsule instead of a tablet, I would sometimes just forget and and type tablet. Um, there are these things called SIG codes when you're typing a prescription. The SIG is the directions and the code um, is shortcuts that you can use on your computer. So, uh, and they're different for every company that you work for depending on their software. Their software is usually um, either something they purchase or in the case of a large company like Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, um, they make up, they have their own in-house um, IT people and they make their own proprietary software. So it's proprietary, which means they own it. So I can't teach it to you. I don't have permission to teach you their software, um, but they're different for everyone. So we don't teach you all the SIG codes because again, they're gonna be different depending on where you work. So for some companies, TT is take one tablet but in other companies, it's T1T for take one tablet. And then sometimes you have to separate it by a comma or sometimes you have to separate it by a space or a semicolon. Um, and I believe Walgreens at the time that I worked there, um, you just spaced it. But then if you wanted to type longhand, um, like after breakfast, then you would have to use a semicolon to separate the, the SIG code from the actual typed out directions. Otherwise, it wouldn't recognize it. So, um, Bruce, what are you doing down there? Stop that. He's licking my foot. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, we have to be able to interpret prescription orders and they have for the last, you know, 100 years or so been written in what we like to call chicken scratch because it's really, really hard to read. It's doctor's handwriting. And think about it. They were sitting in, you know, in their, in their class of biochemistry and biology and all these different classes that they have to take, cardiology, and they were making hand notes. So after a while, you know, they probably had carpal tunnel and other things and their handwriting just got worse and worse and worse. And I used to have pretty handwriting, but um, after my, you know, years and years of schooling to get my associate degree, <laughs> my handwriting is not so great either. So I get it. Um, but we have to be able to um, identify these things. Now, they started a few years ago, and by a few, I mean about 10, because I'm old, so 10 years is not that long. They started doing online orders, um, where they would, um, they would order it, what do they call it? Um, prescriber, prescriber, I can't think of the term now. They had a specific term for it, for the doctors to enter the orders into the computer. So that now, you know, it looks like the typing on your screen and we don't have to worry so much about chicken scratch. Um, and of course, chapter one is all about those, those abbreviations you should not use because they're easily confused with something else. Okay, so where did these pharmacy abbreviations originate? 
um, pharmacy and medical terms, they all come from Latin and Greek languages. And so those were the universal languages in medicine. Um, just like French is the universal language for the Olympics. I don't know why, they just decided it was. And so this is a huge, huge tradition with medicine that they use Latin and Greek. So um, because pharmacy, the, at least in America, we use the pharmacy that began in Europe, the traditions. So most abbreviations have their origins in a foreign language. Of course, when we're doing this class, um, we're, doing, we're using these books, the Mosby's books, and this is true of all of America. We all use Mosby's, and I believe most of Western Europe uses Mosby's, but we can't completely ignore the fact that Asia and China especially has had their own pharmacy traditions for several thousand years, like even before Latin and Greek started these traditions as well. So I'm not ignoring that at all. And um, I've had students from Josai University in Japan that I had a workshop with at UCR. And so after talking with them, I realized there's like a whole half of the entire planet that we're ignoring because, well, for one thing, they were closed off from the world for many, many, many years. Um, and, you know, the rest of the world, they're very insular. Um, and another thing is, you know, we, we Europeans tend to think that we're better than everybody else, even though I was born here, so I'm not European, but you get the idea. People have biases and they are more likely to support their own traditions. So this is what we call, you know, Western pharmacy as opposed to Eastern pharmacy. Okay, so, um, when we write out abbreviations, we want to make sure we write as neatly as possible because other technicians and pharmacists will be reading our handwriting. We still take notes in the pharmacy. We still, um, you know, write things out by hand. And a lot of pharmacies um, don't have, especially smaller pharmacies, they don't have as, as much um, um, computerized um, input. And so they're still getting hand orders a lot of times. So we have to be able to learn all the dosage forms and abbreviations to deci decipher the prescriber's orders. And you guys saw that do not use list in chapter one. So this is because errors have occurred. And so the Institute for Safe Medication um, Practices, ISMP, they came up with that do not use list in chapter one of your book. And the main thing is, okay, all abbreviations should be avoided for the most part. I mean, we know TAB stands for tablet. We know CAP stands for capsule. Um, but for the most part, we want to write everything out. And especially if we're typing, and since we now have all of these SIG codes, then we don't have to use abbreviations as, anymore as much as we did before. So dosing times are abbreviated on prescriptions and a lot of computers are programmed to accept, accept these abbreviations. AM comes out in the morning, PM comes out in the evening. Okay, so drugs come in different classes and the classifications um, can, be, can be different groups that are based on either their pharmacology, what they're intended to do, or their route of administration, or their mechanism of action, or the body system that, that is affected. For instance, all of the H2 blockers or H2 receptor antagonists are things like Pepsid, Tagamet, Zantac. Those are the three big ones. There's a couple more, but I can't remember them right now. All of those block histamine 2, which is a, it's different than histamine that causes a runny nose. H2 is in your GI tract and it causes your stomach to produce more acid. So those H2 blockers, <clears throat> they go in your stomach and they prevent the stomach from making more acid. And because of that, it stops heartburn or it helps, it assists with stopping heartburn. So those are all H2 blockers. And in that case, it's the way that they work, the mechanism of action and the intent of use, which would be for heartburn. So, um, all H2 blockers are in that class because of that. Okay, so there's also classifications of drug sales. 
Um, so that's like, how can the patient get it? So if it's over the counter OTC, that means they can walk up to a shelf at Rite Aid or anywhere, pick up the Pepsid 20 milligrams, take it to the front and pay for it. Legend drugs require a prescription. Um, that should really have RX next to it. And then there's a third class, they call it the third class of sales called behind the counter BTC. Now behind the counter drugs are drugs that they don't need a prescription for, but they have to buy it at the pharmacy. So for two reasons, there's two main classes. The first one is emergency birth control, um, things like plan B and there's another one whose name I don't remember. Um, and those are so that the pharmacist can consult with the patient and let them know that there's side effects to taking those things because they bring on menstruation uh, within a day or two. And so that's, you know, that's going to be inconvenient for a lot of women and it can even be painful menstruation. So um, they need to consult with a pharmacist when they buy those behind the counter uh, things. But um, although a lot of states now have them out on the shelf. So because some people are afraid to talk to a pharmacist and they're embarrassed. So that makes sense as long as the education is out there that patients know that these drugs have side effects. The other type of behind the counter drugs is pseudoephedrine. Pseudoephedrine or Sudafed um, is a drug that can be made into methamphetamine. And so we want to um, control how much people buy. We used to have people that would order like a bottle of 500 at a time of these Sudafed pills. And I didn't know what they were doing with them. You know, they were over the counter, so it wasn't a big deal. And then, you know, we find out later they were using them to make meth. So um, in 2005, they stopped selling those right out on the shelf. Okay, the dosage form is the means by which a drug is available for use. For example, the form might be a tablet, but there are many types of tablets. Tablets can be scored or unscored or coded or uncoded. Um, now this dosage form, mainly they make it a particular form in the way that it's most effective. Now, there are tablets and capsules that are sustained release or extended release or delayed release. Um, and so <clears throat> the, it's the coating that's on the tablet or the coating that's on the granules inside the capsule that, um, that determine whether that thing is um, sustained release or delayed release. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. There's three major categories of dosage forms. There's solids, there's liquids, and there's semi-solids. Solids would be uh, like tablets, capsules, um, suppositories are considered solid or semi-solid because they melt. Solids can be contained in various packages and they're administered by almost all routes except parenterally. Parenterally is injection, okay? Most tablets contain fillers like inert substances that don't have any active ingredient, things like sugar or the coating that's on it or certain additives. Those are also called excipients. Tablets, um, there's different ones. You can have some that you swallow and there's some that go under the tongue, that's sublingually. There are vaginal tablets. There are tablets that go in right in the cervix. There are, um, tablets that uh, you pull down your lower eyelid and place a tablet right inside that lower um, eyelid and then it melts. There are tablets that go into the penis. It's called uh, MUSE, M-U-S-E, and it causes an erection. Most men don't like those because it involves inserting something into the urethra of the penis and um, you know that can be very uncomfortable. So a lot of different tablets. Some can be scored. If there's a line on the tablet that's called a score and it means that you can cut it or break it in half so that you can have half a dose. They can be enteric coated. Enteric means outside and the enteric coating prevents the drug from dissolving in the stomach. The stomach has a lot of acid. Um, and if it dissolves in the stomach, then your body's going to um, absorb the entire thing very quickly. But sometimes we don't want them to, to um, we don't want the patient to um, absorb the entire drug immediately. So we have this 
acid resistant coating, the enteric coating, and then that goes all the way into uh, through the duodenum into the small intestine. And that, that environment goes from acid to base. And so that's where the drug um, dissolves and it dissolves much more slowly and so it lasts longer in the body. We also have chewable tablets with flavorings that are for children or people who have difficulty swallowing. And then extended release drugs are um, made to control the amount of drug that's distributed over say 12 hours or 24 hours. <clears throat> um, fillers on tablets and capsules um, are made of inert substances. Inert means there's no active ingredient for the body, you know, that, that changes the structure or function of the body. Um, they could fill space because if you're giving someone a microgram of something, um, that microgram is so tiny that, mo like, I don't think I could see it um, even with my glasses on. It's so tiny. So they put that into the tablet so it's large enough that they can hold it and take it and know that they got the medication. So it, it fills space and it also might coat the tablet with something shiny that slides down your throat easily or something that tastes good. Coating improves the taste and it also covers unpleasant odors. The Letterly drug company is famous for having all of their tablets smell like vanilla. Um, so when we would do Airy Ped or Airy Tab um, tablets, that uh, which is erythromycin, every time we would open the bottle, it'd be like vanilla, and I would want a sugar cookie because it smells so good. Caplets are tablets that are shaped like a capsule, so they have smooth sides, and they're supposed to um, they're supposed to be easier to swallow. A lot of medications have that extended release form and regular form. One of them is um, Glucophage is the brand name. The generic name is Metformin and it has a 500 milligram, um, it has a 500 milligram, has two forms and one of them is extended release and one is immediate release. So you wanna be careful with those drugs that have the same strength but two different forms because the regular 500 milligrams, the not extended release, they usually have to take that twice a day. But let's say they only need 250 milligrams twice a day, one in the morning, one at night, then they could get the 500 milligram, take it in the morning, and then they don't have to take it in the evening because it lasts all day. Capsules can have a hard or soft outer shell. Now for most hard capsules, the um, outer shell is composed of sugar, gelatin, and water. A pulvule is a type of capsule that's shaped almost like an egg. It's a weird shape and one of the drug companies has, and I think it's Letterly, has a copyright um, or a patent on the pulvule on that shape and the name. Um, no, it's not literally because uh, the first Prozac came out as a pulvule. Um, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. So um, we still consider them capsules. So as you're typing those directions, you're just gonna type take one capsule. Now there's another type of capsule called a spanchule. A spanchule is a capsule that is put together very loosely so that you can pull it apart and sprinkle the contents of the capsule onto applesauce or, or gelatin or other food for children. Then we have soft, soft gels or soft gelatin capsules. Those are also called gel caps. Those are, um, they're sort of fused together so you can't pull them apart. And inside that capsule could be an oil or other liquid. Um, and we usually have things like vitamin A, vitamin D, um, vitamin E, and um, things like docusate sodium, which is a stool softener. Those are in gel caps. Okay. Uh, a troche or troche, you'll hear it pronounced different ways. Um, this is a lozenge that dissolves in the mouth and they're flatter and they're larger than normal sized tablets and they have a chalky consistency. Um, sort of like a Necco wafer, if you've ever had that type of candy. Or um, Tums. Tums look a lot like a trochee, but you still have to chew them. So, you know, they're, Tums are not a trochee, but they look like that. 
Then we have uh, biomaterials. These are polymers, which are long chains of hy hydrocarbons, and these combine with or encapsulate a drug. These can be capsules, tablets, or implants, and the drug is activated by pH or solubility, and the drug is released over a period of anywhere from 12 hours to several years. The implants that go in the upper arm is called Norplant. Those, uh, and there's another one called, um, uh, what is it called? I can't think of the other name of it, but there's little rods that they put in the upper arm for birth control. And those will last, depending on the brand, one of them lasts three years and one of them lasts five years. So here's the um, implants and most of them are contraceptives. Then we have transdermal patches. Transdermal means across the skin. And these are patches that hold a specific amount of medication to be released into the skin over a certain period of time. These are easily administered. Just peel the back off and slap the patch on somewhere. Um, some of them are for pain, like the salon pass patches. You put them right where it hurts, like on your back or your shoulder. And then we have other ones that, um, the salon pass are mostly camphor. Um, things that feel warm to the body. Uh, some of them also have capsaicin, which can burn some people. So need to be careful. These dogs are just running around playing and getting silly. Hey, calm down. Sorry about that. Working from home. So much fun. Um, so these patches eliminate the possibility of an upset stomach. In fact, there's one called a scopolamine patch that's a real small round patch. It goes right on that bone behind the ear and that lasts 72 hours and it, uh, we used to call it the cruise patch because people would take these little weekend cruises to Mexico and um, they would get the patch so that they wouldn't get seasick on the boat. Now, most of the really large cruise ships are very stable in the water. So you don't have a lot of this rocking motion of the boat. So, um, but you know, they wanted the patch anyway. So there's one called a nitroglycerin patch and that goes on the upper trunk area. And that's for chest pain from angina. Chronic pain, there's a fentanyl patch called duragesic, um, and that releases the drug fentanyl over a 72 hour period also. Okay, liquids can be composed of a lot of different solutions. You can administer liquids by all the routes. You can inject it, you can drink it, you can use it rectally, you can use it vaginally, you can use it as a lotion that you rub on the body. Now, if you're going to take it by mouth, um, you can use a syrup. Syrup has the most amount of sugar and then the medication dissolves in the syrup and they improve the taste of the drug. Syrups are usually thicker than water. Elixirs, um, elixirs are, have the highest amount of alcohol um, and most elixirs are oral, you can drink them that alcohol sometimes covers up the bad taste of the drug. Sometimes it's used as a, um, as a preservative um, because you know sugars will eventually grow bacteria. So um, the alcohol helps prevent that. Elixirs are really thin and watery and they have the highest amount of alcohol of any um, liquid medications. Now there are things called spirits. Now these have alcohol also, but most spirits are going to be um, topical. And so you put it on um, and then it evaporates, the alcohol evaporates off, leaving the drug on the body. So they have a lot of alcohol as well, um, but probably not as much as an elixir and it's, um, it's spirits are not meant to be drank, okay? Then we have sprays. There's a lot of different sprays. One of them is called nitroglycerin translingual spray. It has a little pump, so every time you press it, you get the exact correct amount of medication and you, you uh, spray it in the mouth under the tongue. So that's um, sublingual spray or translingual spray. And what happens with under the tongue medications is you don't wait for them to dissolve and then swallow them they um, actually get picked up by the little capillaries under the tongue and go directly into the bloodstream. So nitroglycerin is used for the pain of angina or angina. That's chest pain caused by narrowing of the arteries going into the heart. So the heart feels like it's not getting enough blood and it's extremely painful. 
There's other types of sprays like topical sprays. There's a freeze spray to use, uh, which is um, nitro nitrogen. I think it's liquid nitrogen and it uh, freezes warts. And there's other types of sprays that are used for pain like Bactine is a spray that you spray on cuts. Um, there's one, there's a salon pass spray for pain. So a lot of different um, sprays. Inhalants are um, devices that give patients medication that they inhale. So they all have to be easily inhaled into the lungs. There's some that are over the counter um, and even vaporizers and humidifiers are considered inhalants because they, um, they, they make the water either hot or warm, but they make it into a very fine droplet so, the, so that you can breathe it in very easily. And those are more for um, patients that are, have a, they either have a cold or um, asthma. And then respiratory therapists use nebulizers to give breathing treatments to patients in the hospital. A nebulizer is a device that um, breaks the liquid into a really fine mist so that patients can breathe in the mist. And then the mist contains the medication and it goes deep into their lungs. Patients can also use nebulizers at home. Then we have anesthetics, which are um, drugs that cause unconsciousness. And these are used by anesthesiologists during surgery, and most of those can be inhaled as well, although sometimes they use IV anesthetics as well. A metered dose inhaler, MDI, that is an asthma spray that every time you press it, you get one puff contains the same amount of medication every single time. So that's why it's called a metered dose because the word metered here means measured. It measures the dose. Now we have emulsions and suspensions. An emulsion is, uh, is something that contains water and oil. Water and oil usually don't mix. And if you buy Italian dressing, you know this um, because the, the water sits on top of the oil. So every time you wanna have a salad, you have to shake up the dressing really well before you pour it on your salad. But for um, liquid medications, a lot of times they use these things called an emulsifier. And an emulsifier is a thing that makes um, oil and water like each other, kind of. It kind of binds them together so that they don't separate quite so quickly. A suspension is a liquid that has a lot of very small solid particles that are suspended in the base solution. Emulsions and suspensions need to be shaken, but especially suspensions. Um, this can be used orally by children and older adults. They always need a shake well sticker. Most suspensions come to us as a bottle with a powder in it, and I have one I can show you here. Let me see if I can. So this is, it's a uh, demonstration dose of a drug that's supposed to look like amoxicillin. So I don't know how well you can see it, but it has um, powder in it. So in the powder form, it's good for one to two years. Then once we mix it with a specific amount of water, and we're going to be demoing this um, in a little uh, couple weeks, I guess, once you add the correct amount of water and shake it up, then it's only good for two weeks. So this particular drug is good for two weeks once it's mixed with water. Depending on the drug, it could be anywhere from 10 days to 35 days, some of them even 60 days once you reconstitute them with water. Okay, so those always have to have a shake well sticker because even though you've reconstituted it with water, Eventually, as it sits, and a lot of these have to go in the refrigerator, as it sits, the, the suspended drug powder is going to fall to the bottom. So you still need to shake it every time you give it. So we have to put the shake well sticker on there. <clears throat> an enema, an enema is usually administered rectally, and there's two different reasons why they're used. The most common one is to uh, is for patients who are constipated, and so an enema could be oil or it could be salt water solution, and it goes in and it softens the stool, and then the um, 
the lower intestines don't like really liquidy things and so it evacuates it quickly. So most enemas work within anywhere from five to 20 minutes for most people. So that's an evacuation enema. There's another type of enema that's called a retention enema. Those can be used for um, lesions in the rectum or uh, any kind of a, of a sore or... Um... Bruce, stop that. Um, he's trying to scratch the window and there's a cat out there. Um, so the retention enemas are used to treat the area um, and it can also deliver medication to the patient. So you could have an enema of Tylenol or there's one called a B&O um, and that one's a suppository that is um, for, what is it? Belladonna and opium. I couldn't think of belladonna for a minute there. But the most common enemas are used for constipation. Okay, semi-solids are usually meant for topical application because they contain both liquids and solids. So creams, creams are usually part oil and part water and ointment has more oil than a cream and lotions are thinner than creams because the base contains more water. So those are things that you can put on your hand and if you turn your hand upside down, it usually doesn't drip. So those are considered semi-solid it, ointments contain a glycol or oil base and they cover the skin surface and they help keep out moisture. So most baby um, diaper rash creams are gonna be an ointment or also a paste. A paste is a lot thicker and it contains a smaller amount of liquid than solids um, and they're able to absorb the skin secretions. So a lot of times with, um, with a baby rash, um, you need to protect the skin from further damage by urine. Urine um, can kind of burn the skin depending on what they've eaten or drank. And then we have a gel. Gel is a medication in a really thick liquid that easily penetrates the skin. Most gels will have an alcohol base. It's a specific type of alcohol that for forms a gel. Another very common gel is aloe vera gel. Aloe vera is a plant and a lot of people use the, they just break the leaf and use the gel that's inside there um, to treat burns and rashes and things like that. But you can buy it uh, as purified um, in a, you know, in a tube. Suppositories and powders. Um, suppositories can be used both rectally and vaginally, but it depends on the suppository. Rectal suppositories bypass the stomach, and so if the patient has um, excessive nausea and vomiting, you can give, like let's say they're throwing up. Are you gonna give them a pill that will keep them from throwing up, but oh wait, they just threw up the pill before it even had a chance to dissolve. So in that case, you would use that same pill, <clears throat> but it's in a rectal suppository form, which is going to um, go into the rectum as a solid, and then the body temperature is going to melt that liquid, melt that um, it, usually a vegetable, hardened vegetable oil, or um, or um, almost like a Vaseline oily type base. And then the body melts it and then it absorbs through the rectal wall. Vaginal suppositories are used mainly to treat vaginal infections. Uh, most of the time those are yeast infections. Um, bacteria and yeast are both things that the body contains normally, especially in areas, you know, like skin folds in the vagina. So, Bacteria help keep the yeast in check. So when the patient has, say, an ear infection or a throat infection and they take an antibiotic, um, that antibiotic is not selective. It doesn't just kill the bacteria in the ear or just kill the bacteria in the throat. It's going to kill bacteria depending on the type of bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, it's going to kill it in the whole body. So when it kills the bacteria in um, in the vagina, what happens is the yeast then, because bacteria eats yeast, and so then the yeast is gonna overgrow. And so then they can get a yeast infection. So it's very common for women to take antibiotics and then get a yeast infection a couple days later. So these type of vaginal suppositories um, kill yeast 
and then it takes a while for the body to get back into its normal uh, flora balance. Okay, and then we have powders. Powders are solids, but they've been ground up into a very fine powder. So some of them can actually be, in, be sprayed or inhaled powder, and some of the asthma inhalers now um, are using powders instead of a liquid spray. But then you can also have a powder to sprinkle on a rash. And so one of the main uses um, of powders is uh, for diaper rash. It's the most common use, but it can also be used for other types of, of heat rashes on adults as well. Okay, let's look at routes of administration. The oral route is by mouth. It's called PO on a, on a prescription. You'll see it abbreviated PO. They're very convenient. Most of the time they don't need to be measured. Um, if it's a tablet or a capsule, it's just one or two. They're less expensive. They last long on the shelf. They get into the body system and they're, okay, it says safe. So, but remember, anyone can be allergic to a drug. Anyone can overdose on a drug if they take too much. They can also overdose over time as the drug builds up in the system and some people will have an accumulated large dose not realizing that it was too much for them. So I am not ever going to say that all drugs are safe, okay? Safe is a relative term. Now oral route medications don't work as fast as drugs that are injected because it has to have time to get into the stomach, get throughout the body. Sometimes it has to go through the liver first and you have that first pass effect. Um, so oral drugs most of the time won't work any quicker than 15 minutes, okay? Um, some drugs can't be taken orally because they're not as effective orally. Some drugs, if you put them in the mouth, the stomach will just destroy the drug. So you have to use it as an injection. Nitroglycerin is the most commonly used under the tongue drug, that's sublingual. Then we have something called buccal or buccal agents. These are placed between the gum and the cheek. The medication penetrates the mouth lining and then enters the bloodstream that way. Okay, so it's sort of like um, chewing tobacco that you put a pinch between your cheek and your gum. That's, you know, uh, extremely bad for you because it tears up your teeth and causes mouth cancers. But some people understand that better, you know, than when I say you put a tablet between your cheek and your gum. Rectal agents are abbreviated PR, that's the route per rectum. They're used for a person who's vomiting and can't take oral medications or um, if they have to treat the area sometimes, okay? To reduce inflammation, either ointments or creams can be used rectally in addition to suppositories. Rectal agents usually work on a specific site and not systemically, but sometimes they can be absorbed systemically. So that's where you get the belladonna and opium suppository. It says they are uncomfortable. Now, uncomfortable is more like patients don't want to place things in the rectum. And so they're, they are uncomfortable using them. But once the medication is in the rectum, they don't feel it, okay? It's sort of like... Um, you know, a suppository or a liquid. The amount of drug that's absorbed is hard to predict. And that's very true because the rectum also contains waste. And if the waste is coating the inside of the rectum, then the drug's not going to be absorbed. Okay, so that's, that's when sometimes they need, to use, um, they need to use a laxative suppository first and then use the drug suppository. So, um, you know, this, this is just the way things are. Topical agents are things that go on top of the skin, okay? So their effect ranges from systemic, it can, be, it can be absorbed into the whole body, or it can be localized, which is just the skin area, and that could be like for a rash. These agents can fight skin infl infections, they can fight inflammation, they can block the ultraviolet rays of the sun like a sunscreen, okay, or sunblock. And they work at the site of action or systemically. Their advantage is that it's really easy to apply them. You know, you don't have to swallow anything. You don't have to try and place it in an uncomfortable spot. Um, but their disadvantage is they can cause a reaction. Some people can be allergic to a cream and they put it on and then they get a rash. Um, so we're looking at advantages and disadvantages of all of these areas. 
Okay, let's look at parenteral medications. And where do parenteral medications go? They can go intravenous as a continuous, which means it, um, it, it goes over a continuous period of time. And as the bag empties, you hang a new bag so that you don't have, you, you have a continuous use of the medication. Um, and they do that with bags of fluids oftentimes, like um, sodium chloride or dextrose or dextrose containing electrolytes or sodium chloride containing electrolytes. And then we have intravenous piggybacks, which are used for a short period of time and then they're disconnected from the body. And then six or eight hours later, they do it again over 15 minutes and then it's disconnected. There's also intramuscular injections and there's subcutaneous agents that are injected just under the skin. So the word parenteral is Greek in origin and it means side of intestine or outside of intestine. So um, anything that avoids the GI tract is considered, you know, parenteral, but we tend to think of things that are injected, not creams that are not topical agents, okay? So parenteral things are things that are injected. So the most common medications are given intravenous, intramuscular, or subcutaneous. Now in the pharmacy, we use needles to transfer drug from a vial into a bag or from a bag into a vial or a bag into a syringe. And in children's hospital, we have syringe pumps because most of those kids are too small for us to use a large bag. So we'll put it in a small syringe. So the needles that we use are large needles and we take them off and we cap the syringe or the bag and we send it to the patient, to the nursing station that way. And then they use their very small gauge needles to actually infuse or inject the medication. So the length of that needle depends on the injection site. If it's going to be administered subcutaneous, which is just under the skin, like an insulin injection, then they need a very short needle. If it's, um, if it's going into a muscle, then they need a longer needle, but they're thinner and more comfortable for the patient than if we jab them with our giant needles. Now, parenteral drugs get into the bloodstream very quickly. In fact, if it's intra, uh, intravenous, then it's going in there immediately. We put it directly in the bloodstream. So if it's an overdose, how are you going to get it out? Um, so we have to be really, really careful with this because um, you have to either find the reversal for the drug or you hope that they live while the body processes the drug out of their system, okay? So parenteral drugs work much faster, but they're also more dangerous. They're less safe for that reason. So let's say that the patient swallows 14 Tylenol and you find out within half an hour to an hour, um, the emergency room can pump their stomach and get a lot of that Tylenol out of there. And then they can use um, something that's a reversal for Tylenol um, uh, poisoning. So that's why drugs that are taken orally are safer because you have a little bit more time to get them out of the body. You can give them something that causes them to vomit. You can um, put a tube down through their stomach and then, um, you know, then suck it out that way. So the disadvantage also of parenteral drugs is not only are they not quite as safe because, you know, you can't get the drug back out of the body, um, but there's also an increased risk of infection because you're poking a hole into their body and that hole can either go right into their bloodstream or it could go into a muscle. So there's more chance of an infection occurring there. Injections are more expensive because they have to be sterile. Like when we buy Tylenol or, or aspirin or Benadryl or anything over the counter, those pills are supposed to be clean, but they don't have to be sterile for a couple reasons. First of all, what we eat when we eat food, our food is not sterile because the acid in our stomach is going to kill the germs that might harm us usually, okay? So um, injections have to be sterile, so therefore they're more expensive and they also require preparation and administration by trained personnel. You have to have a pharmacist that, you, that the hospital pays to check that dose and make sure it's proper for that patient. And then a pharmacy technician prepares the IV 
or the injection. And then, so then you end up paying that uh, pharmacy technician. Thank you, I have a job. And then the nurses get paid to administer that injection or that IV. So again, the disadvantage is there's little time to alter its course. Drugs for the eye, ear, and nose. Ophthalmic drugs go into the eye. Now you can put eye drops in the ears, okay? Because um, eye drops are supposed to be sterile. The eye um, has more access and it's very close to the brain and has more access to the inside of the body than the ears do because our eardrums tend to keep, um, it, it's a longer, um, route from the ear, you know, to the brain. And so, um, and the eardrum also protects the area. So you can use eye drops in the ear, but you cannot use eardrops in the eye, okay? So otic preparations for the ear, they don't have to necessarily be sterile. Most of the time they are when you buy them and you open them up. But then once you touch that tube to the ear, you know, now you've contaminated it. But it's okay because your ear is not, your ear canal is not a sterile environment, which we know because we put earbuds and, and hearing aids and things in there all the time and, and we don't sterilize them first usually. So all ophthalmics, which is for the eyes, they have to be kept sterile. And then the ears are called otic, O-T-I-C. Otic preparations are for the ear. So different types of agents are available for the eye, ear, and nose, including ointments, solutions, and suspensions. And these dosage forms work on the specific site. Most ear treatments are done to either clear up infections or to clearing out earwax buildup. They use a carbamide peroxide. So it's like, um, it's like hydrogen peroxide, but it's different. So you don't want to pour hydrogen peroxide in your ear. It might burn. But they make a carbamide peroxide eardrop that patients can, or their parents, can put in their ears and then flush it out with warm water. And that can help clean out earwax. Most nasal sprays are used to treat colds and allergies, but some nasal sprays um, are for other things as well. Eye treatments are for infections, inflammation, or glaucoma. Glaucoma is where there's too much fluid inside the eyeball, and so it's considered high optic pressure. Um, it's sort of like, it could be uh, like a side effect of high blood pressure, or it could be um, just, you know, glaucoma from aging or from other reasons. Inhalants are used to treat lung diseases. Now, mostly for asthma, which I don't like to, when I hear the word lung disease, I think cancer. But most of the time we're just dealing with something like asthma. Now these dosage forms are limited, but they're very effective if they're used properly. Metered dose inhalers are for asthma, bronchitis, or emphysema. And then we have corticosteroids. And they're also available in meter dose inhalers for chronic conditions. And there's two types, um, propellant, which is a spray, and then dry powder, which they have to actively suck into their lungs. So most uh, aerosols come in handheld units and are very convenient. They do have disadvantages because most of the time when they use an inhaler, a lot of the drug coats the back of their throat and then it doesn't get all the way down into the lungs. And if you have a patient that uses an oral inhaler and they're very shaky afterwards, a lot of times that's because their body has absorbed the drug from the lungs or the, um, the trachea. And so then they're absorbing it systemically, but they're not really getting it into the lungs where it needs to be. Well, to combat that, they have these things called spacers. And there's different types of spacers. And so the spacer is like a tube and it's, um, it's usually clear plastic. It has a mouthpiece and then the inhaler goes at the end of the tube and then they spray it and then they can just breathe that into their lungs. Um, it's very difficult for a lot of patients to coordinate the spray and the breathing. So if, uh, if a patient gets a new inhaler and they've never had an inhaler before, they really need to have the pharmacist show them how to use it because you have to shake it. Then you have to start to breathe in and then spray it. 
so that it hits the air that's rushing in and goes straight down into the lungs. I've had a patient come up to my counter many, many times, sit there with their inhaler, and, and they'll spray it and then go, and they'll breathe it right out. They're not actually getting that drug into their lungs. And as it goes into their lungs, they're breathing it right back out again. So they're, they're completely doing it wrong. And so this is why they need to start breathing in, press the, the sprayer, continue to breathe in the drug into their lungs. And remember, they're already short of breath. So they're trying to breathe a long time while they're short of breath. So it's very difficult for some of these patients. And then they need to hold the drug into their lungs as long as they possibly can before they exhale. Now, if they need to do two puffs, they need to wait a couple of minutes because the first puff is starting to open up the bronchial tubes. And if they wait a couple of minutes, the second puff can get deeper into the lungs. So the patients and, and the patients that I've seen at my pharmacy counter are certainly true. They really need help with their inhaler technique. And this is where I've seen some pharmacists that are like, oh, inhale that twice a day, and they're not so great at the consultation part. But I've also seen pharmacists that are really good at consulting their patients with, um, you know, with how to use an inhaler, and it's extremely helpful for those patients. Okay. There are things called a, a depo shot. Um, and we tend to think of a depo shot as birth control, but that's actually depo progesterone or depo medroxy progesterone. And depo kind of means an oily injection. And that type of injection lasts longer. It can last up to a few months, up to three months. So they're very long acting. Um, and so then they don't have to take a daily dose and they and those types of injections should never be given intravenously. Okay, uh, what we call miscellaneous routes are things like um, vaginal urethral dosage forms, suppositories, ointments, foams, gels, uh, vaginal foams that are contraceptives. Um, those are all miscellaneous routes because um, they don't have another place to put them, so they put them in um, miscellaneous. Their advantage is they don't have, they bypass the, the systemic effects. So when they say systemic, they mean the bloodstream, okay? So it bypasses the bloodstream and it affects a specific site. The disadvantage are some patients are uncomfortable using them, okay? Sometimes, especially like contraceptive foams, they can be leaky, they feel weird, and so a lot of patients don't uh, necessarily want to use them. So other considerations are the form and the function. Now these dosage forms are the result of a lot of clinical trials and they look into the pharmacokinetics. Pharmacokinetics is the movement of the drug throughout the body um, and how the drug is absorbed, how long it stays in the system, um, how effective is it in the patient. And so they do a lot of these clinical trials and they have to use hundreds and hundreds of, of patients in these clinical trials. And so over time, they come up with what the drug companies consider are gonna be the best form, dosage form and their function. Pharmacokinetics um, encompasses the different components of the actions of the body on a drug, okay? So the level of the drug throughout the blood and their tissues, the absorption, so we're looking at ADME, absorption, metabolism, I'm sorry, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug. Um, the overall distribution, the reaction of the drugs with other drugs, patient compliance. Compliance is, are they doing what they've been told to do? Are they following directions? The life of the drug, the bioavailability, it, as you absorb a drug, let's say you take you know, 500 milligrams of a drug, it's not all going to be available for the body to use, and that's called the bioavailability. The half-life is at what point is half of the drug out of the system. Bioequivalence, which is um, like, are there other drugs that do the same thing? Are they bioequivalent? And then the elimination of the drug. How does it get out of the body? 
And then pharmacodynamics are the effect of the drug on the body. What does that drug do? So before pharmacokinetics, we're looking at um, almost like this drug is on a roller coaster. How many loops does it go through? So it's the effect of the body on the drug. Now pharmacodynamics is the effect of the drug on the body. Absorption is how much of it gets into the body. So they have to get through natural body barriers like the skin, the stomach, the intestines, the blood-brain barrier, and other membranous tissues. And how well the drug passes through these barriers is the absorption. And it's the one factor, one of the factors that determines its ultimate effectiveness. After a medication is absorbed into the body, it has to be distributed through the body, through the bloodstream, into the tissues, membranes, and ultimately to the organs of the body. Um, so distribution of a drug is not going to be necessarily equal throughout the body. In other words, some of the drug is going to go through um, the liver, and it might actually get, you know, sent out to be eliminated from there. So most drugs bind to blood proteins. Uh, to some degree, and those blood proteins then carry it around the body. Most metabolism takes place in the liver. The other place that metabolism can take place is the kidneys. Uh, for instance, um, Advil, ibuprofen, that's mostly metabolized in the kidneys. So it's kind of weird that way because most drugs are gonna be metabolized in the liver. So metabolism changes the chemical structure of the original drug into a structure that the body can use. So when we make a drug, we have to make it into a chemical structure that stays stable until it gets to where we want it to go. And then once it gets into the body, that structure can change and it can turn it into a form that can then affect the body. Okay, the legal definition of the drug of, of drug, the word drug, is a substance that can affect the structure or function of the body, human body, animal body, you know, some living organism. So your body affects the drug, then the drug affects the body. And different influences can alter that metabolism. Patients that are elderly or very young don't metabolize drugs as well. Uh, women metabolize drugs differently from men. Um, patients with different genetics will affect that drug metabolism differently. Things that you eat affect the drug metabolism. For instance, vitamins A, D, E, and K can only be absorbed in an oil environment. Um, and other chemicals that are ingested at the same time can interact with each other and they can alter the metabolism of a drug. So for some drugs, that dose travels to the liver, part of it is metabolized before the drug has a chance to be distributed throughout the body. So the first pass effect is what this is called, and it's talking about how the liver affects a drug, and it lowers the drug's bioavailability, how much is going to get into the bloodstream and available for the body to use. So first pass drugs are going to be given in larger doses. And then elimination is the last phase of a drug's life in the body. How does it get out of the body? Drugs can be eliminated or excreted in a lot of ways. It can come out in urine through the kidneys. It can come out through the rectum and feces. It can come out when you breathe out in your exhaled air. You can sweat a drug out. Um, and then it can also come out in breast milk. Now the most common method of elimination is urination. And urination and bowel movements are the most common methods of excretion of a drug. Bioavailability is the rate at which a drug makes it to its destination and becomes available to the site of action for which it is intended. So different drugs clear in different ways and at different times. Many drugs travel to the liver with that first pass effect and then less of the drug is available to be absorbed. The half-life is the amount of time it takes the body to break down and excrete one half of a drug. So if it's an 800 milligram ibuprofen, the half-life is the amount of time it takes to get rid of 400 milligrams of the drug. This is an important factor in the creation of the drugs because it tells the manufacturer how long it takes the body to get rid of the entire drug. 
So let's say the half-life of a drug is six hours. Does that mean that the entire drug is gonna be eliminated in 12 hours? No, because it takes longer for that last half of the drug to gradually, gradually go away. So that's why they look at the half-life usually. Bioequivalence is when you compare drugs either from different manufacturers or in the same company, but from different batches of a drug. How equal are they to each other? Generic drug manufacturers strive to achieve bioequivalence to compete with brand name manufacturers. And they have to show the same types of testing that uh, brand name drug companies have. So for instance, you know, the company that makes Advil, that's a brand name drug, and in order to get their patent on the Advil and enable to, and, um, in order to be able to sell it as Advil, they had to do all kinds of testing. So then after about 20 years, the patent expires on Advil and they still make it, but now you can get it in the generic also ibuprofen. You can get Equate ibuprofen. You can get Target with a little arrow on it ibuprofen. You can get it from all these different companies, all these different stores that have different generics. But they still, the company that makes the generic is a diff, sometimes a different drug company. Sometimes brand name drugs will make their own generics. Um, but the generic company still has to go through that same rigorous testing process and they have to show bioequivalence, which means not only do they have to have the same active ingredients, but they have to work the same way and over the same length of time with that half-life and with the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion as the brand name drug. So in the United States, most of our generic drugs in general are very safe. And um, I buy generic Tylenol, Benadryl, Advil, all of those I buy in generic because why pay more for the brand name? So that's my personal take on that, um, but the bioequivalence is the law. Okay, the use of excipients. All medications are prepared with additives or excipients. Those excipients are gonna be coloring, flavoring, fillers, and preservatives. Some patients could be allergic or intolerant to the additives. So here's where you get a patient that says, I have to have the brand name drug. I'm allergic to generics. Well, there's a very, very slight chance that they might be allergic to one of the excipients in the generic drug. So you can't just roll your eyes and say this person's crazy, even though, you know, most of the time they're not really allergic to generic drugs. Okay, so they can try a different generic company or, I think I have dog hair, sorry, or they can pay more for the brand name drug. Most insurance companies will not pay for brand name drugs if a generic is available. So they're gonna pay more if they want the brand name drug if the generic is available. Other types of, of excipients are things that increase the dispersion of a drug once it reaches the intestines or things that release the medication over a longer period of time. The ever-changing world of drug manufacturing has made available many different choices. For instance, a tablet is not just a tablet. There's many different types of dosage forms depending on the desired effects of the drug in question. Now we're looking at package and storage requirements. One thing um, I have to see at the end of this PowerPoint, if it addresses, and I made this PowerPoint, so I should know this, but <laughs> we have to see if it addresses disposal of unused drugs. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. Um, packages, packaging and storing. All of the types of dosage forms must be approved by the FDA. Medications are packaged according to the manufacturer's specifications to ensure the effectiveness, effectiveness and shelf life of the drug. All medications have a package insert that describes the storage and stability of the drug. And a lot of drugs have to be kept at certain temperatures. So um, I need to look at the temperature range. And I think that's one thing I forgot to put in this PowerPoint. So I need to make myself a note. Storage temp ranges. Okay, so we're going to go over that because a refrigerator uh, is not just a refrigerator. It has to be within specific temperatures. So we'll look at that. 
Now, looking at medical terminology, because we're talking about Greek and Latin terms, most of the medical terms have their origins there. And there are four segments or word parts. The prefix is the very beginning of the word. The suffix comes afterwards, and then you have the word, root word, and then you have a combining form, which is a little vowels, usually A or O or I. So let's look at a particular word. Cardi, let's see, para, cardio, okay, pericardi, I think they're talking about pericarditis. Okay, and the, this particular slide is not very helpful, so I apologize. So we're in chapter five. Um, I taught at one school that actually made my students take um, medical terminology. It was helpful to a certain extent, but mainly what we're using um, in order to do billing and outpatient pharmacy is the um, diagnoses. So we don't necessarily, like DJD, degenerative joint disease, we don't necessarily need all of the medical terminology. But if you look on page 121 and 122, 123, yeah. So 121, 122, and 123, there's little, bits of medical terminology and remember if you take medical terminology this is the entire book is medical terminology and I have one around here somewhere because I had to teach it um, and I learned right along with my students it was wonderful so for instance um, I would look at the abbreviations on 122 table 5.10 because that gives you the basic ones that you'll see most often, and there's maybe 40 of them at the most. Uh, for instance, OBGYN refers to obstetrics and gynecology, you know, uh, women issues. HTN is hypertension, so you need to know that one because if a patient is not diagnosed with hypertension, some drugs might not be covered by their insurance. And of course, things like ER stands for the emergency room. Um, DVT is a deep vein thrombosis, DOB is date of birth, okay? So you do want to go over those, but you don't need to know necessarily all of this um, stuff there. Now there are some suffixes that you need to know about that are not in this book, and it's the drug suffixes, the drug name suffixes. And most of the time, the name of a drug, the suffix indicates what class it goes into. So for instance, um, a drug like um, propranolol ends in O-L-O-L. -L. The drugs that end in A-L-O-L um, -L or O-L-O-L, -L, those are beta blockers and they're used to lower blood pressure. So you have propranolol, you have uh, carvedilol, um, Breva block is, um, it also ends in LOL, but I can't remember the generic name off the top of my head. So those types of suffixes we use more in pharmacy than um, actually, you know, this other type of medical terminology. So just so you know. So if you have any questions, um, I think I have a student here with me now. So if you can ask me questions now, or you can email them to me and um, I'll get back to you. Okay. You have any questions? I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop recording.